We looked at CDC recommendation for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. We evaluated and managed common drug-drug interactions and we looked at patients who experienced intolerable adverse effects and how to manage them. Now, let's educate an HIV patient on important lifestyle modifications. So now that we have really good potent uh, HIV regimens, uh, our HIV patients are actually living longer. So now we have been able to actually study and see, uh, you know, how how does aging affect HIV patients? Because before, patients would die within 10 years of having HIV. So we couldn't do these studies before. In fact, you can see that in the in the 1990s, a lot of patients would die as they age, like very quickly. And then, you know, throughout the 2000s, as we improve treatment, uh, you know, more and more patients are actually uh, living longer compared compared to the uh, non-HIV infected patients. And this was this was a study from Denmark. So one thing that's important as people age is, you know, people start to develop comorbidities. So, you know, whether it's uh, hypertension or diabetes. Um, so when you compare HIV infected patients with uninfected patients, you can see that, so for example, blue is, uh, you know, three or more comorbidities. So you see in the elderly of 65 age, uh, years or older, the number of patients who have three or more comorbidities is a lot higher than patients who do not have HIV. So this means that, you know, at the HIV clinic, um, managing these uh, comorbidities becomes extremely important because you are more likely to encounter patients who actually have a lot of these uh, comorbidities. Even in younger patients, you can see that, uh, you know, you can see that compared to the uninfected HIV patients, have uh, more comorbidities. So you can see that these comorbidities include uh, hypertension, which is the most common one, but also you can see HIV patients are more likely to have MI. So when you compare, uh, so orange is HIV infected, blue is HIV uninfected, you can see significant difference in MI, uh, but also peripheral arterial disease, uh, when you, can, uh, you know, also CKD. So factors related to non-AIDS uh, comorbidities, you know, obviously aging is a huge part of it, but, you know, unfortunately we cannot do anything about aging. And then the other thing is that chronic HIV infection will lead to um, chronic inflammation. So even in patients who have undetected viral load, there will be chronic inflammation. And as we know, um, in, you know, inflammation can lead to fibrosis and uh, multi-organ uh, uh, damage over over many years. Uh, there's ART toxicity, so you know whether it's uh, TDF causing bone toxicity or um, nephrotoxicity. That's something important for for the pharmacist to monitor. So if someone is losing bone density, you know you may want to intervene uh, and switch them from TDF to TAF or other regimens that uh, are not. Uh, as toxic. Another thing is that uh, these patients, uh, based on their risk factors, they could also be co-infected with other viruses uh, such as hepatitis C. Uh, of course, obesity, exercise, and di diet and smoking are the most important lifestyle modifications. And the reason is HIV patients are at high risk of having cardiovascular disease. And because of that, these risk, uh, these are things that are um, associated with cardiovascular disease. So uh, it is extremely important to provide education to HIV patients who would benefit from weight loss. Uh, it's important for them to exercise, and it's important to also give them education about diet. In fact, most H most HIV uh, clinics actually have a dietitian as part of the team, so that they actually get a a comprehensive education uh, about diet. So dietitians have an important role uh, in the care of the HIV patient. Now, when it comes to, you know, like, so you can provide education for uh, weight loss, exercise, diet, and smoking. The most important out of all of this is uh, smoking. So these things can lead to inflammation, uh, you know, this lipidemia, in, insulin resistant, and the, uh, decreased physical functioning, which over time can lead to end organ disease such as cardiovascular disease, um, you know, CKD, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome, 
a neuropsychiatric uh, dysfunction. Again, uh, most ART agents are uh, generally well tolerated. Uh, when it comes to NRTIs or nukes, uh, you know, older NRTIs are more likely to cause dyslipidemia. Uh, you know, newer uh, NRTIs are less likely to cause dyslipidemia. TAF in particular can increase uh, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL. Um, you know, but overall, the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL is not changed. Newer NRTIs are unlikely to cause insulin resistance. Um, of course, we have discussed that TDF can, uh, you know, reduce bone mineral density, and TAF uh, significantly uh, less likely to to do this. And when it comes to bone marrow suppression, this per specifically happens with older NRTIs. So zidovudine is one of the older um, NRTIs that we still have on the market. And then with cardiovascular disease, Bacavir is associated with MI, which is kind of controversial because FDA has not found a correlation between Bacavir and MI, whereas some observational studies have. When it comes to integrase inhibitors, um, the boosted Elvitegravir is also likely to increase uh, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL, but it doesn't really cause anything else. Uh, protease inhibitors, uh, especially the older ones, uh, were associated with uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, darunavir and etazanavir are, um, you know, they can still increase um, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL, but not as much as some of the older uh, protease inhibitors. And then uh, with uh, NNRTIs or non-nukes, efavirenz in particular can uh, slightly increase triglyceride, LDL, and HDL. So in the 2018 American Heart Association guidelines for cholesterol management, they actually uh, added uh, HIV patients as one of the risk factors for having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So they did say that for patients who are uh, 40 to 75 years of age with LDL 70 to 189, and this is in the absence of, um, you know, uh, uh, clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the absence of diabetes. Uh, so if someone doesn't have those things, and LDL is 70 to 80, 189, if you calculate the 10-year risk score and it's um, 7.5 or higher, uh, then someone who is also uh, infected with HIV, they can benefit from stat uh, statins more. So if you uh, you know, had a patient who, um, you know, you weren't sure if you should start a statin, but they had HIV. So that can push you toward actually uh, prescribing a statin because they're more likely to uh, to benefit from it. And of course, these are the statins that are, are recommended, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so the following year in 2019, the American Heart Association actually released guidelines for cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV. So this is HIV specifically. And they had, they had two types of recommendation. One was lifestyle optimization and one was uh, pharmacoprevention prevention of cardiovascular disease in HIV. So at the top of the lifestyle uh, optimization is smoking cessation, followed by limiting alcohol consumption. Uh, increasing, um, you know, physical activity on a regular basis. And of course, uh, they refer to the 2018 guideline for dietary guidelines, which emphasize vegetable, fruits, legume, uh, healthy protein sources, whole grains, and non-tropical vegetable oils. And they wanted to patients to limit intake of sweets, uh, sugar sweetened, and artificially sweetened beverages, uh, as well as red meats. When it comes to pharmacoprevention, um, you know, in general, there are four groups of patients who benefit from statin therapy. And this is similar to non-HIV infected patients, uh, but this guideline, uh, this algorithm is specific for HIV patients. So for secondary prevention, it's basically someone who already had an MI uh, stroke or peripheral arterial disease. So someone who already had, a, had an event you want to prevent another event. So that would be secondary prevention. And these are uh, patients uh, aged 21 or uh, older with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and they will be considered high risk. So they need uh, high high risk uh, approach. 
the rest of the uh, the groups who need uh, a statin would be primary prevention so these are people who have not had a event yet but we want to prevent them from having an event for the first time so it would be uh, you know so 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 the second group would be uh, patients with a very high LDL, so LDL 190 or higher, that would be high risk. Uh, the third group would be di diabetic patients aged 40 to 75. And then the last group would be people without diabetes, without high LDL, and without clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in these patients, we calculate atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And they did have three different calculators that you can use so the most famous one uh, that's commonly used nowadays is the 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, risk score and they did say that you can uh, you know if it's 7.5 percent risk or higher there will be high risk if it's less it will be low risk now they do say that these calculators did not have uh, hiv patients in them and in general hiv patients are uh, 1.5 to twofold uh, they have uh, 1.5 to twofold greater risk of having cardiovascular disease. So whatever you calculate, it's more likely higher in uh, people uh, living with uh, HIV. So for example, if you calculate it to be, uh, you know, 6.5, in an HIV patient, it will likely be more than 7.5. So you can consider them uh, high risk. And um, in high risk patients, basically, you go to this green area. Uh, you know of course you start with uh, lifestyle, lifestyle uh, modification so such as uh, smoking cessation and then you want to use a, a lipid lowering uh, drug therapy uh, statins uh, primarily whereas uh, for patients who have low risk um, you know statin therapy may not be indicated and then when it comes uh, to smoking they looked at uh, smoking cessation in people who are infected with HIV and compare that to people uh, who had smoking cessation uh, but they did not have HIV. So here on the y-axis we're looking at the incidence of a myocardial infarction and on the x-axis we're looking at the in time in years. So you can see that the lowest uh, risk of MIs in patients who do not have HIV and uh, who never smoked and when you compare that to HIV positive patients who never smoked you can see this is uh, pretty uh, pretty similar so this uh, you know uh, slightly higher in HIV patient, uh, patients who never smoked but still higher in HIV positive patients now when you compare to uh, people who were previously smokers and uh, did not have uh, HIV. So, you know, that's more, you know, even a history of smoking increased the risk of MI more than uh, HIV did. But when you compare uh, former smokers who uh, actually have uh, HIV positive, you can see this is significantly higher. So a combination of HIV and smoking is very detrimental as far as incidence of MI. And you can see the maximum amount, uh, the maximum risk of MI is in patients who are HIV positive, who are current smokers. So, you know, uh, smoking cessation, you can see that it will reduce the rate of MI uh, significantly. Um, so when you provide education to the patients, you know, you can uh, talk to the patients about uh, weight loss, you can talk to them about um, statin therapy, uh, you can talk to them about diet um, and exercise, uh, but the number one thing that you can recommend to the patients is uh, smoking cessation if um, they are smokers.